of course, like to thank everyone for making this debate possible. The resolution we have today is military conscription is a superior alternative to a voluntary army. In this speech, I'm first going to be defining the resolution, setting up all the parameters of this debate, and then going into our case. So we'll be defining military conscription as compulsory enlistment of people into the military, and we're not, we want to make this clear, we're not forcing everyone to go and they must meet the uh, qualifications needed to get in, and also it's not that everyone will be serving on the front lines, it's just that they have to be a member of the military. Um, is a superior alternative is, in, on balance, has more benefits, and to a voluntary army as in a situation in which all people willingly enlist themselves. So uh, we're going to be setting this debate up as uh, the weighing mechanism here will be net benefits to the United States, so whichever side can prove that having a military conscription system in the United States is superior, or having a voluntary army system in which everyone volunteers is superior in the United States. I'll take a question right now. Just so there's no confusion, we're talking just about the United States, right? Yeah, a situation in which the, mil the United States military is either conscription or voluntary. Okay, so with that being said, the weighing mechanism here is going to be net benefits to the United States, as I said. So with that being said, we have five contentions to prove why a military conscription system is superior. Our first is that there will be less unnecessary war. We can see that people in power that have served in the military are, do vote no on war more often than voting yes if they think it's unnecessary. So we can see what will happen is in the long term, if people have served in the military and then go into politics, they are less likely to, be, uh, to vote more yes on unnecessary wars. So ultimately what will happen is you can see that there more lives will actually be saved because of this and more unnecessary, like, there will be less unnecessary damage and less, less unnecessary spending going into the military because there will be less force there. So, and also, this creates in a system in which there's less war ideology. Essentially, people know what it actually means to be in the military. It's not people don't kind of imagine, just don't really see what war is. They don't know what's happening actually when you go serve in the military, so they don't really know, and they think, therefore, it's okay to put people into the, these situations. But now that they know what really being in the military means, they're going to be less likely to put people into an unnecessary situation. Also, we can see that there will be less unnecessary war because people will be less incentivized to attack the United States, knowing that our military is bigger. We can see that there will be a lot less uh, attacks on the United States, ultimately lowering the amount of wars happening as a whole because people will see that we have a strong military and lose the incentive to attack us, therefore saving more lives of the United States and saving a lot of American lives and damage uh, for the United States. Our second contention is that it will be improving national security. We can see that when more people are ready to fight in the military, we can see that obviously our national security will improve as we will have more able troops used to defend the United States. So we can see that there will be more people in uh, the military, the army, the air force, all the navies, all of that stuff, so that people will be more able to fight more, um, have the ability to fight more quickly. And that's a benefit there because it will be helping the military in the long term, helping the United States national security. Also, we can see that the population will be more ready to defend itself. It's not going to be a lot of people in situations not knowing what to do, in situations like there is a natu natural disaster, for example, or a catastrophe of that sort, people will be able to uh, defend themselves more adequately having gone through military basic training. And there's a benefit to that because we'll be saving a lot of lives in the long term. Uh, so with that being said, our third uh, contention is that we're providing more people with opportunities. We can see that going through basic training and being in the military gives you a job training, essentially. More people will be qualified to do more things and be able to work better. When everyone has a place, everyone has a little bit of training going in, they'll be more qualified to work in jobs. Therefore, we can see that the economy improved because people will be able to work more efficiently. People will be making money, helping the economy, creating more jobs through that. Also, we can see that um, everyone will have a place to go if they are already in that situation because of the possibility of re-enlisting. When everyone goes through and serves in the military, or not everyone, all the people that are eligible to go through, um, everyone has a place to go if they lose a job. And they have the option to re-enlist in the military later. So it really gives a lot of people a fallback, which means that there's going to be less people on welfare, less people on unemployment and service and things like that because they have an option to go there. Also, we can see that um, our, our fourth contention now is that different types of people will ultimately join the military, which will lead to an increased amount of innovation. We can see that what's happening right now a lot of the time in the military is people that are enlisting are just people that want to go into combat or people just want to fight. However, when everyone's going in, it's a lot of different types of thinking. We're going to have a lot more people with like engineering mindsets or scientific mindsets or doctors or philosophers and things like that. And when there's more diversity of types of people in the military, the military will see more innovation. There'll be different strategies, different technologies developed overall, and we'll see an improvement in the military in that sense because there will be more different types of people joining, creating a more diverse military that has more benefits there. So we can really see that that's another benefit that comes straight out of having this. Our final contention is it serves to unite the country as a whole. This is going to be a major one. We can see that there will increase the amount of unity within the country. When people serve in the militaries with a more diverse nation, we can see that it will lead to things like a uh, decreased amount of racism, a decreased amount of uh, sexism and things like that. There will be more societal benefits that come out of this. Because when people serve together in the military, a lot of the times they get into that um, working together as a squad, and then they start to ignore things like race and things like that, because the United States has really been plagued for centuries with things like racism and sexism, and this will really serve to reduce the amount of things happening there. Also, we can see people in the military are more likely to vote 
We can see that a lot of times in the United States, a huge amount of the population isn't actually voting in the status quo. However, we can see that there's a, a, people serving in the military and more voting is directly related. So when more people are serving in the military, they will have more involvement with people voting. And that's good because then we have what the voice of the people in the government. And ultimately, the government will be improved because it has more voices being heard in it and more involvement there. Also, we can see that serving in the military will ultimately uh, boost the economy in the long term. We can see that a lot of people, for example, after World War II, when a lot of people that were in a conscription in the military came back, the economy experienced a huge boost. It's thought because the people have more appreciation for what they have, so they're more willing to spend money and things like that. It's not exactly known, but we can see that there is a direct correlation between that people after serving in the military are more likely to buy things, more likely to invest, more likely to boost the economy and help the American economy, which is a direct net benefit that comes out of that. So really we can see that there's a clear benefit there. Also we can see that this will have, have another societal benefit, is that when people serve in the military, they, uh, it's proven that they have more forethought before making decisions. Now this is good because then there will be a decreased amount of crime in the long term, just kind of uh, drug use and things like that. Are you getting up to ask a question? Yeah, sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask, what is your evidence that they have more forethought in making decisions, and what exactly does that mean, to have more forethought in making decisions? Uh, well, more forethought in, as in people are thinking more far ahead, thinking what consequences that will happen because of the decisions they're making and the actions they have because of the logic that they need to make and the decisions they need to make on the battlefield and that training they've given, knowing how to think on the battlefield. So we can see that people have more forethought. That means that people will be doing less things like going to crime, getting to gangs, doing drugs, because they will think about the consequences farther ahead. And that's a benefit for the United States because we'll have a healthier population that makes better decisions, which is obviously good. So to go through uh, my contentions again, because we have a lot of them, our first is that it decreases the amount of unnecessary wars. Our second contention is it will improve national security. Our third contention is it provides more people with job opportunities. Our fourth is that different types of people it will enlist, which leads to innovation in the military. And our final contention is that it will serve, unite the public, and have societal benefits. So for all of these reasons, I just strongly would favor the Thank you. Thank you. You don't have to blow up, really. Um, and then we're going, yeah, I don't really have very much off case stuff, it's mostly on case traits. Alright. But that we agree with all their framework and all their definitions, so that's all fine. Net benefits to the United States is great. We're just going to be talking about conscription in the United States. And with that, let's just move on to their contentions. So their first contention is that there are going to be less unnecessary war. Um, however, this is simply untrue. So turn this argument, please. First of all, larger armies create more potential for war. If we have less armies, that means that the United States obviously has less potentials to attack other nations. If we look at the history of the United States empirically, the United States has not been attacked by other nations nearly as often as it goes into other nations to attack them. And obviously having a larger standing army through conscription would give the United States more opportunity to leverage their military military advantage against other nations, thus causing more war and then causing more deaths among civilians in these nations as well as the deaths of Americans uh, who have been conscripted to fight. And so basically, this would actually cause more war if we were to uh, increase conscription. Also, uh, if we only were to have volunteers, there basically, there's more incentive for peace talks if the United States has uh, a smaller military, essentially because if we do have a conflict with another nation, if we have a large standing military, then obviously the United States, instead of you know having an incentive to negotiate with them would just drop their military on that nation, do whatever the United States wants, um, achieve their objectives. But that does not create any less war. It um, basically is a greater incentive to fight and kill more people, once again, not only civilians in those nations, but military personnel in the United States. Uh, also, they talk about how there's less incentive for other nations to attack us. Other nations don't attack the United States anyway, and currently we have a volunteer-only um, army. We have nuclear weapons, which of course are a huge deterrent. Basically, the only attacks that we've seen on the United States are um, from terrorist organizations, etc., which having a large conscripted army doesn't really protect against. Also, empirically untrue, nations that have large armies uh, often are attacked. Let's look at Israel. Israel has a huge conscription policy. Every person in Israel is required to serve, oh, almost every person in the Israeli military. Israel gets attacked all the time. So basically we can see that this contention is simply untrue and actually creates more potential for unnecessary war. Now their next potential is, uh, sorry, their next contention is better protection. And they talk about how having a larger army would create better national security for our nation. However, once again, um, this isn't necessarily true. Firstly, because of drone warfare. The United States has entered a new era of military um, invention. And so 
basically we have drone warfare now, so when the United States wants to achieve many of its military objectives, for example in Afghanistan, Pakistan, those regions, instead of actually sending in military personnel, since a lot of the fighting is guerrilla warfare, we send in drones instead because they're more effective in achieving these objectives. We don't necessarily need to have a large standing conscripted army, but rather we can just use our technological innovations and lever that, leverage that advantage rather than our population advantage over nations that we have conflicts with. And thus these drone warfares, um, they perform often tasks that are too dangerous for military personnel, and in that way drones are actually superior to um, superior to a large conscripted army. And so once again, it's not the amount of troops that matters, but how you utilize those troops. So if, even if we have a volunteer army, those volunteer armies are enough to uh, you know man or not man the drones, but uh, use the drones from the bases. And so we don't need to have a very large standing army. Um, also, keep in mind that drones, when, as opposed to like a troop presence, if we have a large troop presence in a foreign nation in order to achieve our military objectives, it's very difficult to win over the hearts and minds of the people of those nations. And it really makes war kind of a bigger deal for those nations if you have a huge standing military there. And so in, uh, in many ways, drones are actually preferable to a large standing military because often they're more effective and can perform more dangerous attacks, but also a troop presence often escalates war to new levels, once again, killing more civilian lives. Uh, with that, I'll move on to their third contention. Um, also, they kind of talked about economy at the bottom of their case, but it wasn't really a contention, so I'm just going to group that here with more jobs, economy. And so basically, the only reason that there would be more jobs is because we're going to be spending huge amounts of money on our military. They don't really explain where this extra money is coming from, because the United States federal government is going to have to pay every soldier it conscripts. So once again, turn this argument, this is a huge spending disadvantage, because we're spending huge amounts of money for our military. Obviously, when we e increase spending, either we have to increase taxes on the American people or we have to cut social services, both of which are bad for quality of life in the United States. So if we want to preserve quality of life in the United States, we want to have uh, lower taxes so that our economy will ultimately be better. Uh, lower taxes basically help to stimulate the economy, stimulate business, etc. And so basically, if we're going to look at the outcome of the economy by increasing our military, it would be better to keep our military small, keep our spending small um, in the long run for our economy. Uh, their, next is, uh, their next intention is innovation. So basically, it's easier for people to explore their fields if we're looking at people who are going to be making technological innovations, if they're, you know, at a university or if they're at um, a company that's developing weapons, etc., rather than if they're on a military base. The military is not really a catalyst for innovation, necessarily. It's better for people to make scientific advancements in an environment that really is their purpose to make these scientific advancements. So, for example, a person who's working at, um, I don't know, a university or something, they're uh, surrounded by their academic peers who would be able to um, collaborate and essentially uh, peacetime collaboration is much better than wartime collaboration because they don't really have to worry. You know, if you're working on a military base, you kind of have to worry about being attacked all the time, all these other things. It's not a good environment for innovation. So their last contention is country unity. So once again, turn this argument. Actually, conscription would cause social unrest. Obviously, when wars are unpopular, people don't like to be conscripted and that makes them very angry at the government. Angry people do not uh, create a country unity. If we have an unpopular popular war like the Vietnam War, people are just really mad about being conscripted. Uh, they also talk about more people voting. They don't really explain the impact here. How does more people voting have a tangible impact on the United States? Uh, what really good comes out of this? And they talk about this argument, um, people who are in the military, oh, this is, I don't know where this really fits, but the more forethought argument, um, they don't cite any uh, particular studies. They don't really talk about exactly what this means. They don't cite any evidence saying that this is true. And so there's really no reason we should believe that soldiers have more forethought. Uh, with that, I'll just move on to our case. Once again, like I said, mostly case turns. So basically, our big contention is quality of life. If you're conscripting people, then it's going to break up families, and it's going to, once again, cause resentment against the government, and it's going to cause a huge amount of emotional trauma and fear for people who may have to be conscripted. Obviously, it's very bad. People don't want to be conscripted to the military, and so it causes a lot of problems internally, and it disrupts the nation's productivity, etc., simply because so many people are going to be in the military rather than producing for the nation in the nation. And our last contention is uh, conscription is uh, sexist. Because the selective service only conscripts males. Only males have to register for the selective service. So the institution in and of itself is inherently sexist, um, both because only males have to serve and also because females well, are not conscripted. And so basically, for all of these reasons, I strongly urge you to vote in favor of the navigation today. Military conscription is not a superior alternative to a voluntary army. Thank you.
um, before I begin, I'll first just go into a uh, side opposition case and then back into side government. All right, to start off, um, first I'll go through their case. Their first contention was about the quality of life, breaking up families and productivity will decrease. Um, but we looked at this, it's going to be more of a natural part of life that the men and the women are both going to be enlisting. It's only going to be for a year to two years, and they're going to actually see benefits before they start a family. It's going to be at a younger age, so it's actually going to give them experience to have a family and establish a family. So it'll decrease teen pregnancies, that which will be a benefit. But when you enlist... Um, at the younger age, you're going to see that it's going to allow them to have job experience, possibly go on to schooling. It's going to give them a foundation for the rest of their lives. So before that, they have a family. Um, they will be more prepared. They will have some sort of resume. They will have, they can always go to the military and um, pursue that for their life. But it's going to stop, we'll see a decrease in teen pregnancies, younger pregnancies, families that aren't ready to um, go forth with that because they will be enlisting. Um, and then they'll have a life tracked out for them. So it's not going to break up families. They'll actually help them in the long run before they settle down and are ready for that. The impacts will be a lot a lot more long-lasting. We see that when you go to the military, you're, again, your logic changes. You're thinking more sensible to, and um so that they're more likely to get jobs when they are ready to have families. They'll be more settled, more likely to have a better income and, and not need to go into social services. And if they do, then they can go back to the military and get a job there. I'll take your one or two contentions. Um, so just to clarify, are you actually going to want to change the selective service laws and conscript women as well as men? Um, well, the current um, conscription laws would be men and women, yes, if you meet the qualifications, as long as you aren't disabled, no health risks. Um, not a criminal or any such. Um, so then on to their second contention about sexism. All men and women can enlist. We see that the sexism that they're predominantly talking about um, back from the last drop, that's really not nearly um, as present in today's society. We have to look to today's society where we do see men and women um, on the combat field and involved in the military. So this will actually decrease um, sexism within the military and then outside the military we see that um, it's going to be um, more obvious that there's a common thread for um, both people in the military. Again, they don't have to uh, to just take combat combatant um, jobs, they can take other um, jobs in the military, such as science, engineering, um, desk jobs, whatever is mandatory or necessary that they are able to do and pursue. Um, so sexism really isn't an issue here. Um, now on to our case, our first contention is about less than necessary war. Um, so we talked about that because uh, more people are going to be involved and know the hardships of having to go through war and how much it takes that they're less likely to want to go and vote for um, war. We see that our politicians are now going to be involved in the process of having, or possible pro um, politicians um, in the future are going to have the experience to see what it's like so they're not just saying, oh, let's make, like, example, our, the Iraq war is a quick decision with not many thought processes. If they know the hardships and what it contains, um, we're not, we're, our government and our policies are less likely to make um, choices that are going to put that at risk. Um, long term, we're going to see um, that we're not going to have to go to war nearly as much because people won't be wanting to vote for it if they know the actual consequences and what it's like for them to have to go through it. This means that in long term, we're not going to be having to spend nearly as much on wars that really we're not wanting to be there for or they haven't been logically thought up. We're going to save more lives in international conflicts that op um, opposition talked about. It gives more leverage to fight war and because we'll have a stronger military. But we see, again, this isn't true. We're in a dom democracy where we still have to vote for this. We're not going to, um, our government's not just going to send us to a war where we don't have political support to do so. So, um, so really that um, cancels that out. Uh, their contention about Israel um, gets attacked all the time. This is for religious basis. This isn't because they have a strong military. The reason why they're getting attacked is for religious ideologies. Um, we know that the United States isn't set up on like that, so it's not a, a, a necessary example. Um, I'll take your last one real quick. Before all right, is referendum required currently in order to declare war or establish a troop presence in a foreign nation? Um, well... You can sit down. Um, well, we still have to vote to some sense, and our uh, president isn't just going to send us to war without some consent. Congress won't let that happen. I'm not really sure about your question. But um, now to keep continue on, um, less war ideologies, the whole idea about um, we're not going to want to go put all of our troops in the war when it's not really necessary. There's no benefits that are going to come out of it. So really, in the long term, we're going to have a stronger military that other countries aren't going to want to necessarily fight against. Um, and then as a public across the whole, we're going to have just a, a decreased war ideology and have a more value of life. When we see that each person is going through the hardship of being trained for the military knows um, and has that bond and unification, we're going to have uh, less war ideology, not want to go spend all the money and have to... Um, 
really put all of our families on hold. Their second contention is about improved national security. We have a stronger military. They talked a lot about drone where drone drone where uh, excuse me drone, drone warfare. But we see that having people go into um, conscription, uh, conscription, we're gonna able to have um, scientists and other people to further the drones. We know that drones are having a lot of issues with um, human malfunctions, but by having people conscript, we're not just having people in combat. You have to remember we're having people in engineering and science to improve these things because we know drones aren't up to the level. So long term effects that we're gonna have is that our science and engineering aspect of the military can improve exponentially and at a fast rate because now we're having the whole United States public who um, is going to be involved in the military improve that and um, change the way of workers. So hopefully we're not ever going to have to have um, them be sent off uh, to actual uh, fight combat uh, warfare. This also improves our national security because we're able to give out more aid. It's going to help our um, relations under this. Um, having people that are able, to, more people in the military, it's going to allow for um, less troops just to be sent out because it's necessary to fight war, but we can provide more foreign aid troops to help other countries who might be in need. So it's a beneficial for international relations. Um, and again, we can't um, assume that we're just side up decisions kind of under this presumption that just because we have a strong military, we're still going to go to war. You can't take that into account. You have to look at the benefits that are coming out of conscription, not just if we're going to war, because this isn't... This resolution isn't saying because we're creating a strong military, we're going to go to war. What it's saying is that's going to add for unification. It's going to increase our military options um, and really provide us with a stronger defense against other countries. Um, our third contention of us is about how it provides opportunity for um, people who are going to see a lot more jobs and that people are going to have a place to fall back. Side opposition was concerned with this spending a lot more money and how we're, we're going to pay for this. Um, but if you look into the long-term impacts on how people are... Um, the benefits that are going to come out of this. Um, people are going to have jobs and that they're going to be able to invest in the economy in long-term solutions. Um, there aren't going to be um, having to go on as many social programs because they will have a job experience. We know that when people go into war, or, or excuse me, go into the military, that sets a foundation um, and some sort uh, of resume for them. So long-term, we're going to see that's going to help the inter economic community um, in that sense that they're not, have to, they're not going to have to go on social programs, look for um, assistance by the government. Um, but as far as spending, that really isn't a long-term big issue. Our fourth contention is about different types of people. They said that people can go to universities, but I think they kind of misunderstood this point. It's about military advancements. We're having more of uh, the public come together and advance our ideas together. Um, and it's going to decrease um, uh, discrimination for all these reasons. I have a strong vote in favor of side government. Thank you. So just as a brief off-time roadmap, the way that I'm going to be going is just on to case, and then if time permits at the end, I'll go on to ops case. So with that, let's begin. So the first contention today is that of less unnecessary war. And the major argument for this is that um, politicians who are going to come back from the military and they're not going to vote for wasteful wars. And then the example that they brought up of a wasteful war that politicians wouldn't vote for, I guess, is that of Iraq. But there's a couple issues with that. One, that there's consistent wars uh, building up to where Iraq happened, and the majority of the senators were around during the times of Vietnam and the Gulf Wars, and yet still there's an incredible amount of support in Congress for Iraq, and obviously there was some dissent towards it, but there was a large bipartisan um, amount of support initially for the invasion into Iraq. So that argument doesn't really hold water, and overall, if you look in the grand scope of the resolution, there isn't going to be less unnecessary war because of our response to their next contention, the fact that there's going to be more war because the United States will become a more belligerent um, and military type of country. And so there's going to be more opportunity for the United States to invade because we have a larger army um, at our disposal, and that's going to directly basically nullify the argument that people aren't going to vote for war because in reality um, our country is going to become increasingly warlike and more belligerent. So they go on to say that, you know, that... There's going to be less attacks because we, uh, there's going to be less attacks in the United States. And, oh, also, they mentioned the fact that we're going to have to vote for going into war, which is simply not true. The United States, like, there doesn't actually have to be a vote to go into war. The, you know, the president has 
levied undeclared wars throughout our history. Um, so when they say that Congress has to approve the war and all this other stuff, that's not true. The president has authorized troops without formally declaring war plenty of times. So the institution of war in the United States has not been democratic. And so, no, there's not that check on it. But um, moving forward from there, they talk about, I think on their next intention, that there's going to be less attacks because we have a large military and we're going to be intimidating them. But that's not true. So they say that having a conscripted army will deter people from attacking us. As my partner already brought up, we already deter people from attacking us because we have a gigantic nuclear arsenal and we have the largest military capability of any country in the world. In fact, by far the largest. So we don't need the conscription to further deter people because we already deter people. Um, they're making this argument that the United States Army is, for some reason, inadequate. They, this seems to kind of be a theme that's going along throughout their case. The United States Army is not inadequate. The United States has the most powerful army, the most powerful mili military, and the strongest military infrastructure of any nation in the world. In fact, um, this will be a consistent theme throughout their case. So when they're, making this, when they're making the argument that we need a bigger army to deter people, we already have a big enough army to deter people voluntarily alone, and we have the nuclear arsenal. So that's also not true. Um, and so they say that, you know, we don't have to, we can't just look at uh, the people who are going to be fighting based on military conscription. We have to look at the other benefits that they make up, that they bring up. And so I'm going to talk about the other benefits when I go down the rest of the case. But that statement alone, you have to think about the fact that we are sending these people out into military combat. And as they pointed out, it's not going to be everybody because there are going to be people who aren't in military combat roles. But we are conscripting people to send them to wars. And that's American lives. So yeah, there might be other benefits, which I'm going to talk about as not being true. But at the bottom line, we're talking about sentencing people basically to risk their life in the United States without them volunteering to do so. We are forcing people to risk sacrificing their lives overall. So, uh, moving forward from there, they talk about uh, there's going to be increased protection. We respond to that with, we don't need it because warfare has shifted from humans into drones. And so they responded by saying that there's going to be more scientists to improve drones. And this is also going to tie into their innovation argument later. But we don't need more scientists to improve our drones. The United States has such a strong military infrastructure already. We are the most, we are the, we are the leader in military innovation in the development of military technology. Our, um, our top engineers willingly go into the military to develop new technology, or to the private sector, which, the, which is also a fantastic institution that the United States has, where all we have this sort of military development that's going on. We don't need to conscript people to do it because they're already willingly doing it well enough already. And so the negative disadvantage coming off of conscription can completely outweigh. It's just an, an unnecessary action to take. Um, so they further on going saying about the economic opportunities, and specifically to say that spending, the spending disadvantage that Christina brought up, is not a long-term problem, but our debt to China is a long-term problem. And the fact that China owns a considerable amount of United States assets is a serious uh, national security risk that we need to deal with. The United States debt and our deficit is a serious problem, and for them just uh, to brush it off as saying it's not a long-term problem is fiscally irresponsible and simply not a wise thing to do. But more importantly, they say that this is going to train a workforce in jobs, and so something that they fundamentally misunderstand is that conscription, they said in their definitions that it's just going to be the basic exemptions that we already have. Right now, the selective service is only required for men. So only men can be conscripted into the United States military. The United States cannot conscript women. And so they brought up that they can enlist, but that's fine. That's voluntary. So that's not what they're advocating for. They're advocating for conscription. Females cannot be conscripted under the Criminal Selective Service Act. Therefore, these economic opportunities, these job opportunities, all this training, it's only happening for the men. Only men in the United States will get this great job training that they're talking about, which is inherently sexist, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But think about that when you're uh, evaluating that argument. So going further, um, I already really touched upon the innovation argument uh, on the drone stuff. But they talk about the unification of the country, and they really didn't get into this. They sort of dropped it at the end because they ran out of time. But the idea that it decreases racism, I'll contend that that's true. Having a military does decrease racism. But the idea that it decreases sexism is not true because only men can be conscripted, and currently women aren't even allowed to serve in combat roles. So military conscription, where we're just conscripting the men, is a sexist institution because it's making this unfair distinction between the two sexes and saying that, well, only men are capable of military service or only men are capable of combat service. And so you have to look to that when, and it's also only forcing the men too. The women aren't forced to do anything. So there's a sort of unfair distinction that's going on there. And so um, they talk about, under the unification, they also put down more voting. And again, not really seeing a major impact coming off of this, but there's not really going to be more voting in a positive sense because there's going to be increased resentment towards the United States because as we pointed out with Vietnam, there is a serious not liking of being forced to serve in the military. So they talk about the economy boost, and again, you can apply the arguments I made earlier about the spending. 
it's not going to boost. It might boost our economy, sure, but ultimately the spending is going to outweigh whatever boost that it puts through. So we can't look to that. And again, on the forethought arguments, I'm not really sure uh, where the evidence is on that. And even if it is true, impacts are outweighed by the rest of our case. So going on case, uh, we talk about quality of life. And so they say that women are, it's going to be a natural cycle of life, that men and women are both going to list. As I said already, women aren't conscripted. That argument isn't there. They say that people are going to be more sensible. What about post-traumatic stress disorder? What about people who suffer like mental illnesses once they go into war and see the horrors of that? They're not taking that into account that war is not a game. It's not something you do for fun and then learn, get job opportunities and go back to the United States. You're risking your life and seeing your comrades die on the field all the time. So it's not something we're just sending people to, which is this nice little place where they can get job training and come back to the United States and make everything better. These people are risking their lives on the field, and so you can't look to that. And our second condition is that of sexism, and so you can just apply the arguments I said earlier, but basically military conscription is sexist, and it, it, it creates a sort of dichotomy between male and women females that we are trying to undermine the status quo. And for these reasons, I urge you both in favor of litigation today. Thank you. Opposition. Um, I'm just going to be going over voting issues during this speech, mostly, um, I think, you covered most of the on-case stuff. Alright, with that, let's begin. So our first contention, voting issue number one, is loss of life. So while they contend that there would be less loss of life because there would actually be less war and war with military conscription, once again, I think my partner did a pretty good job on the flow that's showing that we would actually create a more belligerent culture, a culture that would actually want to perpetuate war. They talk about how maybe senators, um, representatives, etc. would vote not to go to war because they've seen wars and seen the atrocities that occur during war. But once again, there's the empirical example of senators, Congress people wanting to go into Iraq after seeing the Vietnam War, after seeing the Korean War. So that's empirically disproven. Loss of life will occur ultimately if we conscript because we'll just create a more military-like culture. Also, um, once again, if we have a smaller army that gives the United States less uh, military might essentially and therefore we would have less incentive because we wouldn't um, have as strong a military to invade other nations, cause conflicts there once again. So loss of life is the major impact here. Not only loss of civilian life within the nations that we are using our military force against, but also loss of life of the conscripted people in the United States. So this is a huge impact, obviously, death is very bad. Um, and so our second impact in this round is the economy. And so, of course, they seem to think that this is going to stimulate the economy because we're going to be creating more jobs, but these jobs aren't being created out of thin air. The United States federal government is going to have to vastly increase its military spending, and they can get the money for that from basically one of two ways. Either they can increase deficit spending, which is going to rack up our national deficit, which is going to cause increased problems with China, and that, of course, could lead to a war, and if we have a large conscripted army, who knows where that could lead? It would be very bad. More loss of life there. The other thing we could do is cut social services, which once again would be bad because it would decrease quality of life. We'd have people who wouldn't get Social Security, um, Medicare, um, other types of services that our government promises for people. And so very bad, this um, this increased spending for the military. And it's just completely unnecessary. We don't need a larger military. My partner uh, said pretty much that we don't really have uh, problems with our military right now. We have very strong um, nuclear weapons programs, other type of technological programs. So we don't really have a problem with our military as it is. And therefore, um, just please vote on this economy point because either way it goes, no matter how we get the money to fund this plan, it's going to hurt people either through quality of life or causing problems with China, which could escalate into a bigger war. Um, our voting issue number three is innovation. And so basically they try to say that innovation is going to be good for them. That we're going to have innovators making new military technology, making the United States the top of the military with you know their new drones, their better drones, all that kind of stuff. First of all, um, in the status quo, that's already true. The United States already has the best military in the world, the best military technology. We're already doing very well technologically. And so we should have our best and our brightest doing perhaps more peaceful things. Also, they don't have to be conscripted into the military in order to make these advancements. But if we make all all the best and the brightest minds in our nation go to the military. We're not going to have anybody working on alternative energy. We're not going to have any people working on other things that make our country function. And all of our... That's, um, when in any of your speeches did you mention the possibility of innovation going to other places? Oh, we were just talking about how it's better if it's concentrated in the United States so people can focus on other things. So, um, I... S we can't order okay. the best we're too judgeous in our mind. <laughs> I'll roll on it. Um, you know, I'll just... Continue. Yeah. I don't know. A couple You're at 257.
All right. And so basically, you know, people could be working on other things. If they're more concentrated in the United States, innovating on other things besides weaponry, this could be um, better for the United States as a whole because this innovation would be a more productive innovation considering the United States is already on top. And so our uh, fourth voting issue in this round, which they dropped in their last speech, by the way, is that of social unrest. And so they have this contention about uh, how it would create country unity, but they dropped that contention in their last speech, and we turned it, and we said that it would actually cause social unrest because many wars, which the United States goes into, are actually quite unpopular. Once again, the Vietnam was, War was very unpopular. And when you get social unrest, obviously this causes a lot of problems, not only with riots, etc., but in government as a whole. And so we don't want a nation that is really kind of um, splitting over the issue of war. It's just going to cause more social unrest, more resentment, and it's just going to be a bad thing for the United States as a whole if we create a more belligerent society. And so our last voting issue in this round is going to be quality of life. This is basically one of the largest voting issues in this round because, of course, going to war is a terrible thing. Oh, also, I'm putting sexism under quality of life because sexism is another big impact in this round, and it decreases quality of life for both men and women because inequity, obviously, is just bad for everybody. Um, it creates a dehumanization. It just... Sexism is bad. <laughs> but anyway, they, we agree that uh, perhaps... Um, conscription would decrease racism, but also when you look at the sexism, if you look at, um, basically, racism is not um, as large in the military as sexism is today, considering our current laws regarding um, conscription, because only men must register with the selective service. This is sexist both to men and to women. Only men are forced to participate in the military, and women, uh, basically, it's, you know, kind of a slap in the face of women saying, you're not fit to serve. And so, basically, um, sexism is bad there. Also, war is completely awful. It's a decrease in quality of life, not only for the people who are conscripted, obviously, Obviously, many of them are going to die if they're being conscripted, decrease in quality of life for them, decrease in quality of life for their families. Obviously, many people are probably not going to have fathers, brothers, anybody who's conscripted, which would ultimately be bad. So all of these reasons I strongly urge to vote in favor of the negation. So I'm just going to their case, our case in voting. My time right now. So really, I'm going to start by looking at the voter issues they've had. Their first, their first voter issue was that of loss of life because will somebody be creating a belligerent society that wants to perpetuate war? You're really going to cross play this with the first contention we had. It's something that we really failed to respond to when we see that there are politicians that have served in the military. They're more likely to vote no on wars that they think are unnecessary. That's going to be our main response to this point, really, a lot of their case. That's something they never really responded to. They brought up the example of how some people experienced Vietnam and Korea. However, a lot of the people voting in Iraq, voting to go to Iraq didn't actually serve in the military at that time. So we could really say this is a moot point because it doesn't really matter because they they weren't actually serving in the military. They really have no link that having people serve in the military will somehow create a militant, belligerent population that doesn't happen in other countries where there is military conscription. So really they have no warrant or a link there, so they should be dropped completely. Their second contention was that this will harm the economy, which will ultimately lead to a war with China. That really was never impacted down to their last speech, so I'm not going to address me too much. We can see that there will be increased military spending in the short term. However, there will be economic benefits coming from this because this money is going to be going into other places stimulating the economy. So really, I'm going to get a little bit to that more when I get into our case, but really that's what the main part is. The third contention was that innovation is uh, that people can work in other places. We agree with that. That's why conscription isn't a lifelong commitment. After you serve in the military, you can go all through and serve and innovate in other places. That's really a non-unique argument that the benefits are claiming. And they also argue that the status quo is somehow good in terms of innovation. We agree it is very good, but it could be better. It could improve by having different types of people serving in the military in the long term, which will have more increased types of innovation than what's happening in the status quo. Their, final, uh, their next voter issue was that of social unrest and how wars are unpopular. We agree with that wars are unpopular, but you've got to look back to our contention saying that the amount of war will go down because politicians won't be as willing and the population will be less willing to go to unnecessary war. So there will be less social unrest because there will be less unnecessary war. They seem to be believing this fallacy that bigger military equals more war. However, that's not true at all. We can see that's what's happening right now, is that just because you have a larger military doesn't mean you're going to be more religious in going into war in more places. Um, their next voter issue, I'll get to your question after I go through your, 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 the rest of your case. Their next voter issue is that uh, the quality of life will go down because people will die and that the families will be broken up. I'd like to point out that there's still an issue with a volunteer army. It just really is a non-unique argument. However, with a um, conscripted service, it becomes more of a society of people serving in the military before they create families and things like that. So it's really not going to be lowering the quality of life. It's going to be a change in society, while, in the volunteer, while a volunteer army would, not have, would have more of these problems. And they also talked about sexism. This really has been a big un misunderstanding in our plan. We're not going back to the World War II draft system in which only women can serve. We are saying inherent in our case in which both men and women will be conscripted into the military. So really all of their sexism points shouldn't stand as it's really clear in our case that's what we're talking about. So really I address their uh, contentions about quality of life and sexism. So really when you look at their case, it really shouldn't be standing at all as it either doesn't apply to this debate or doesn't really make any sense.
And that being said, we'll be moving back into our case. Our first contention about the less than necessary more, this has really been a major point in this debate, and really going to be what wins this debate. Well, actually, before I go into it, I'll take the question. No, it's fine. You can answer. Okay. Um, so really, we can see that um, their really only big, their big responses to this is that more people will want to go to war and create a big military relation, and a bigger military equals bigger war. But we're proving that's not true at all. Just because you have a large military doesn't mean you're going to be more incentivized to go to war in the long term. We will be dropping our argument that it'll lower the incentive. We agree that there's already enough there in this um, in the status quo. Uh, so really, we can see that. Also, their argument with more incentive for peace talks, that's the other argument with the voluntary army, there's going to be more peace talks. They never really said why this would happen. There's no link um, with which to claim this benefit. So really, we can see that that's not true at all. So really, that's something that you should not flow through at all. And you can see uh, that it's pr tr truth that there's less unnecessary war. When there is less unnecessary war for the United States, that means we can claim more benefits of lo uh, loss of loss of life. We're, we're going to be having, we're going to see less loss of life. We're going to see less PTSD. A lot of the disadvantages they brought up. So really, this is something that should flow through. Our second contention was that of in, uh, improves national security. They're really uh, only response to this is that drone warfare works right now. However, they never really said why a voluntary army has a better system for uh, drone warfare compared to a military conscription service. So we can claim all the benefits. However, militaries do have to occupy certain areas, and when there's more troops, obviously, that will get easier to occupy. They said that somehow that's unpopular. I'd like to point out the unpopularity that drones have right now in the status quo versus occupying an area. Drones are extremely unpopular in, uh, civil in populations because they believe that they're killing innocent civilians. We can see a lot of times people are shooting drones into fields and ending up just killing a shepherd and his goats instead of actually killing what they're looking for. So uh, uh, having troop presence is better than the drone warfare's. Our next contention is that provides the people with more opportunities, and the really only response to this was that of more funding that's going to go into the military. Yes, we can see that there will be more government spending in the short term, but there will be more economic benefits as this money is going into places in order to innovate the economy in the long term. So we could really see that that would mean that more people have uh, job training, both men and women. Everyone will have a place to go if they are in need of a job because they have the option to re-enlist. So really we can see that this is another benefit that should flow through. Uh, our next point about innovation, they really just said innovation can happen in other places. We agree with that. After you serve in the military, you can go and innovate wherever you want. However, it is a difference when you're focusing on innovating the military specifically, and there will be more benefits there. And our final contention is that it will be uniting the people, which is another major point in this debate that's really been talking about. Their really only response is that it's sexist and it causes civil unrest. I responded to why it wasn't sexist already, and I really said why it will not create civil unrest, as there will be less war in the long term. So really, this point should flow through as well. It will unite the people, create less racism, something they compete, create less sexism for the same reason. Increase appreciation for the country and create more forethought. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Good space. Do you want to stick it out? Or? I don't care. That rule doesn't make sense. Yeah, judges aren't allowed to compare anyways. <laughs> Our minds don't even enforce the rules. <laughs> I can't film what? what? It's too late. We didn't sign that thing. Wait, you put the wrong piece though. Right, oh. You can go first. Did you ever sign that thing in previous rounds? Yeah. 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 She put the date as April 3rd. It's so the wrong date. Well, that double applies the contract. No, it doesn't. Alright. Uh, wait. Are we done? Alright. Um, it's me and Pilbara. Oh, yeah. Do you want me to turn it to you? Sure. I'm um, about to get his right ankle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this was a 2-0 decision for Los Ganos SG, the negative, congratulations, you guys didn't need the ballots, so, <laughs> you whatever. All right, so let me, I, I'll talk for a while. Okay, so let's start with the sexism argument, which I find, which I find interesting. I, I think that that had a lot of potential, I don't think you guys executed it particularly well. I think you should have done two things. First of all, you should have taken their innovation point, or sorry, uh, job training point, and agreed to that, and then use that to say that like men get significantly more job training than women. He told me to make that argument like mm -hmm. right after my speech, or no, well, right before. Right before no, I don't know. He told me to make that argument, but somehow it never came out. It's fine. <laughs> um, second of all, it was very difficult to weigh in the panel because I don't understand the impact. Like, I, I know the sexism isn't bad, but I have trouble weighing it. So, like, if you guys, like, 
read like any like feminist literature, right? You would know that you can always like argue that like patriarchy that create that is created in a society is like the root cause of war. Right? Oh, okay. So you just be like society becomes more sexist, therefore the logic that leads to war permeates society, um, and that gives us like like death impacts and body count. Yeah, okay, I mean, I don't know if you noticed, but when I was talking about sexism, I was, like, trying to go a little deeper with impact, but, like, I just couldn't yeah, no, think of guys, anything. It ran out of time. Or <laughs> then there was that argument that you guys, like, made, like, five seconds, which was, like, we shouldn't force people to sacrifice lives, which I thought should have been, like, huge. Like, it is, there is a moral distinction between making a person, like, voluntarily die versus, like, forcing him to, like, die, right? And that didn't come, like, this is not a utilitarian argument. So you need to like provide me with an ethical foundation explaining why like voluntarily dying is fundamentally ethically different. But that didn't really come out of this like, five second clip. Uh, then there is the argument about racism, which I, I don't think should have, was a good idea to concede. Like you can very easily argue that like sending people to like abroad to kill brown people. <laughs> uh, conducive towards like reducing racism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, so like white people and black people can be friends as they kill brown people. <laughs> okay. um, Fair enough, yeah. Then, <laughs> uh, I mean, some of, yeah, uh, okay. Oh, yeah. Then there's a lot of arguments on like the, the resume arguments. I, like, I, I, I thought that like it was really obvious that like people who want these resumes or experience can enlist anyway. So I don't really understand how that was. I didn't see this particularly strong argument. Um, like, yeah, it's like if you want jobs, you can list right now. That's what our minus do. Um, yep. Huh? What? Really? What was the? You said. What were you saying? Oh. I was saying that like people who want like job opportunities can enlist anyway. Oh yeah, I'm I'm gonna be a second lieutenant in the States Army this summer. Yeah. Okay. Then national security. A lot. Okay. Then actually, let's go to the main argument that I thought was interesting. Actually, but before that, I think there are two things that you guys could have ran, uh, which I really expected, and I was like, the obvious argument that didn't come out. First of all, like arms race, right? Like when countries see that we like have like millions of people enlisting, they're like, holy crap, what are these guys planning? Right? Like for no reason, because typically you have conscription during wartime. Like it has almost never happened that we just randomly have conscription without a major war. So, so China looks at that and I'm like, holy crap. Right? Yeah. Uh, second of all, like it's not that we don't have people, like actual humans fighting in the battlefield right now, it's that they're not soldiers, they're like private military corporations. Yeah. And there are a ton of dissents to PMCs that I, I, would, I would have a hope to say. To then there's that thing about like science, right? And it kind of seemed like implicit in the round. Hmm? About what? Science. Like, oh, okay. How this interacts with art and science. And it seemed implicit in the round that like what is happening is that you're producing a bigger army by conscription. It's not necessarily true. Like you can just conscript like a very small percentage of the population rather and like reduce military input, right? So I want some sort of an an like an analytic on the top, which says that like like it's a double bind. Either we keep the number the same, in which case like why are we rejecting people who want to serve and forcing people who don't want to serve, or we increase the number, in which case we trigger the impacts. Okay. So that being said, uh, I don't think there was particularly decent, like good weighing in rebuttals because you have a lot of stuff, and it's difficult to like evaluate between. Um, and I thought that the first first argument and the turns on the first contention, like with war, was the easiest place for, for me to vote. But like you guys could have, if you thought that you were winning on something else, you could make that uh, outweigh the first contention, right? But that like without the way being that for me, I'm just like, hey, it stops war. So going to the first contention, uh, first of all, I think there was an argument like, so uh, here, here's how I see it. They tell me that like. Uh, there is a the capacity to wage war increases, and they tell me that the willingness to wage war decreases. So I have to weigh these two against them, each other somehow. First of all, I found there was a really obvious argument that wasn't made, which was like weighing those on a 
time frame, like if people enlist now, that's not going to affect politics for like the next 20 years until they get old enough to like be politicians. And by that time, the rules will probably change anyway. So um, yeah, and the time frame would have been a lot easier. But that being said, like the way that I evaluated this is you you base your argument on democracy, right? Willingness matters because uh, there will be a democratic impact where people are not willing to vote for war. They tell me democracy doesn't happen because the president just does whatever the hell he wants. He, like Libya, he didn't even bother to ask Congress. And Kucinich was like, maybe you should ask us. Everyone thought he was crazy. Um, which means that like willingness doesn't matter. But I'm like, so you have a bigger army and you're going to wage more wars because you can't. And then more wars means more death. So they win. Yeah, I went pretty much more war equals more death. So I, the loss of life, I think, was the most important thing that happened around. Um, I think there were some other uh, interesting arguments made. I think also where you lost a little bit was um, on defense, because there were a lot of drop arguments that you had in the round. Like, I just had places where you could respond um, to whole piece of arguments, which gave them a lot of offense at the end um, for me to vote off of. Um, and so, uh, especially when you when you look at um, the the less necessary words, you don't really respond to the fact that the president can send troops without needing Congress. And so, if you have a bigger argument, you have bigger capacity. Which you should extend on your vote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was the the main place was there. But I, I, I do like I, I think that your economic, uh, economic argument was good and needed to be fleshed out a little bit more. But um, I think that was also a place you didn't really respond to because. Um, how are how are we going to be spending on this? The other thing that you talked that you, you you started talking about a little bit, but you could also like either we have to increase taxes. So basically, you said like there's no no way in which this economic argument is good. So I thought that was that was a good argument. Um, yeah. All right, so I strongly encourage you guys to come to the GA after this. Your sure. Actually, I mean, I have something. Time being I'll give it a third time. <laughs> um, just a stylistic thing, I've seen both of you all debate now. One thing I've noticed is that when you guys get to rebuttal, you have a big tendency to sort of just go through what you want and sort of say, this is my argument, this is my argument, and stuff like that. You're not utilizing your rebuttals. I don't have kind of hinted at it before with anal analysis comparison. Your job as a rebuttal speaker is to figure out where you're winning and where you're not winning and to go hard and all in on things you're winning. So, for example, you had options to choose from between like sexism impacts and death impacts and things like that. You had options on racism, for example. There's these things like people talk about probably called like blowing up an impact, where if something's kind of smaller earlier, but they really undercover it. You just go in all, all in on that, right? Like say racism is the most important impact in this round. It's the most like racism will undermine everything. It's really, really racist and stuff like that. Structural dehumanization is always the root cause of any sort of violence. As long as we continue to be racist, we're going to continue to perpetuate war and just go on this like complete rant that undermines the entire case, right? So you don't necessarily have to go in all in on one thing, but you should be picking strategies and doing argument comparison instead of just like restating what happened already in the round. Yeah, there was a lot of spending time on like rehashing arguments you already been made instead of like weighing out how those arguments compare in the round. So instead of like restating your points entirely, like tag your points but blow up like the impact on like the, the unique arguments that you're making. So strategic use of time. Right? Especially when you're making five contentions, so you already know that you're going to be at a time stuck because you have, you spread your contentions rather, your time on each contention rather thin because you have five to address in any given time. So instead of like having three half of all five, go to the ones that you have the most like, weigh on and really like, spread those ones out to make it blow up how big those are. Right. Yeah, especially when, you're, when you care more about the impacts than we necessarily care about like, the slow debate. Because I was willing to say, like, okay, whatever, that, that point doesn't matter. Because if we're going to weigh, like, you know, dehumanizing everybody and everyone dies, blah, then that, that's the biggest point in the round. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. As a factual note, the selective service does not conscript women. Yeah. If you want to conscript women, you should do that in your plan. That should say our conscription will conscript everyone.